right, so week number three. So uh, we also have some, got a bunch of ads this week. A bunch of people wanted to join in on the class. So for all of you, you, you know kind of the situation if you read the syllabus or looked at the other details that, um, you know, you really aren't behind other than um, the weekly turn-in things that are just five points each. But even those, you know, if you get behind, um, turn them in. One thing, too, that I'll say on grading, just before we get in there, um, if if you see your grade and you're doing great and you're like, you know what, I, that term project sounds like a hassle. I'm just going to not do that. <laughs> well, that's not a great strategy because what will happen is at the end of the term, your um, score for that will be entered as a zero. And so right now, just the way Blackboard does the grade calculations, it's not part of the calculation. So um, I would very much um, discourage you from, from you know, this, this class is not hard to get a good grade in. But if you skip an assignment because you think you got a, an A already, and then all of a sudden about a week out from the, uh, from the final, you see a zero entered. And it's not just like, you know, an F. An F is 50%. Um, no, a zero is is nothing. So and anyway, it it can be quite detrimental. So anyway, I I have had some students in the past going, yeah, I decided not to do the term project and didn't work out for them, or just took them down at least a full letter grade by not doing that. So I know it can be a hassle, but I also know that it's pretty much the most useful thing in this course. So we'll talk more about it as we go. Um. Tax concepts. Yeah. Nobody likes taxes, obviously. Nobody realizes really what they're even paying in taxes, and especially what they're going for. I mean, I'm not going to get political here, but if you think the tax dollars you use wisely, uh, I, you know, I, I celebrate that. I, I'm, I like that positiveness. Me, myself, I actually spoke to the IRS today. I've, I've still got some tax returns from uh, 17 and 18. And you know, if you're not if you're not pushing things to the limit, you're not trying. So uh, anyway, it's no big deal. They didn't pay me the money yet, so they're not. Um, you know, I'm not in any serious trouble. But they're they're uh, they want a few more documents because I've got you know multiple businesses and multiple write-offs, and by God, I'm going to take every single one of them. And uh, I actually had a uh, a lady who was she was amazing. Uh, I say in the past tense because she passed away. It's been that long. But we worked on these taxes together. And, um, you know, she was an accountant. She did this stuff full time. And I thought I knew a lot. Oh, my God. Well, this woman, she worked for the IRS for a long time. And then she became a lawyer. She went to law school at like 62 or something. So she was getting up in her years. But, uh, man, she saved a lot of people a lot of money because she challenged them in every, every step of the way. And. Perhaps maybe she challenged a little too hard, and that's why I have this discussion with the IRS. But it'll all go well. But you know, I I would hate to go through life, and 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 that is a problem. Most people are too cautious with taxes, and they overpay. You know, th that would not fly in places like Europe, Europe, France, especially. They have a huge value added tax, like twenty percent sales tax, but they don't actually call it sales tax, and you don't actually see it because it's already included in the product. So it's very insidious. But they know full well that <laughs> if they relied on people to file their annual tax returns, like I get a tax whatever document from Germany, and uh, it's not much money because they already got their money. They took it up front. They use this VAT, you know, the value added tax, and they took 20% every time a product changes hands. And so they end up getting a... a they don't do income tax. They do a little bit in property tax, not much. Most all of it is just this uh, kind of sales tax on steroids. So enough of that. Anyway, I'm just saying that our tax system is is incredibly complex. In fact, one one more aside. There was a guy. He what was his name? Anyway, he was a uh, an old Secretary of Defense, and you know he thought he was just a big. You know, I was in the military, and some people they take themselves pretty seriously and, and this guy he, he you have to sign off on your taxes every year saying that I filled these out to the best of my ability 
and in, in accordance with all the applicable tax laws. And, and this guy would always enclose a letter saying, oh, this is beyond human capability. I could not, in good faith, say that I actually complied with every law because it's incomprehensible. There's so many conflicting things going on. So anyway, he, he would, I don't know that it kept him from being audited. But uh, anyway, it, it was pretty realistic because the, the tax code is complex by design. I mean, it's it's there's there's the the loopholes are the are the tax benefits for other people. Everything that's in that tax code is there for a reason. There's some constituency that's benefiting from it. So things are not necessarily in there by mistake, and the complexity. Uh, you know, it employs a lot of folks, a lot of lawyers, a lot of everything else, and including more IRS agents. So anyway, uh, you know, roads, the military, they pay for a lot of things that are obviously quite worthwhile. Um, and then you also pay a lot of taxes. Most people just think income tax, but I've alluded to sales tax, which isn't really an issue in most parts of Alaska. There's some here in the valley for the first 500 bucks. But nothing in Anchorage, except now they have some sin tax on alcohol and other things to, you know, obviously nobody is going to come rallying to the defense of, of, you know, folks that they can, whatever. Nobody wants to be known as the one that says that their alcohol is getting too expensive. So it's it's a pretty easy kill for, for the politicians. Um, anyway, consumer purchases, wealth transfers, capital assets, and then... Uh, these special taxes, those are kind of the sin taxes, the ones that people maybe feel guilty about or, oh, it's paying for the roads and stuff like that. But actually, it probably just ends up in the general fund and, and off it goes to a bunch of whatever. I mean, I don't have to talk about how your taxes are spent, especially if you live in Anchorage and you've tried to deal with snow and you realize that snow plows seem like a worthwhile use of, of, of uh, you know, taxes except for the people who who have control of that money uh, background on taxes corporations pay taxes on profits so corporations you know big evil corporations but guess what corporations are owned by shareholders and so the deal with corporations is they pay a tax as a corporation because they're an entity you know they're they have personhood status that's a great advantage of being incorporated is that it it's a perpetual thing. It, it, it's not tied to a certain one person. But the problem when it comes to taxes is that that entity, that tax is, uh, you know, there's a, a corporate income tax on that entity. And then the actual entities, the shareholders, the people who own those shares, they get taxed again. So double taxation is something. If you hear about that, that's what they're talking about. Corporations paying corporate tax and then the shareholders getting that profit and being taxed on it once again. Homeowners pay property taxes. Yes, they do. Again, very uh, uh, whatever MOA centric. It's it's quite a bit higher in in uh, the uh, Anchorage borough. Um, they are tax deductible though on your um, federal taxes, which is um, good. We'll talk about tax deductible. We'll talk about tax credits also tonight. Taxes you use to pay for government services and programs, and you pay them generally at all levels. Um, and even in Alaska, I mean, we, we do better because of the, the PFD, the permanent fund, but we still, you know, if, if you're, the fees you're paying to DMV, the fees, fees you're paying on your property tax, um, they're still getting some tax out of you. And, oh, by the way, if you tax a corporation, well, corporations, you know, they, they don't have an endless source of funds. They sell stuff. Well, they sell stuff at a bit higher price that they're getting taxed at a higher price. So you're paying their tax. You know, it's just passed right through to you. So it all happens. Federal income tax, the IRS. Quite familiar with them. Um, taxes are paid several ways. Yep, time transaction, withholding and estimate a quarter of the payments. So what happens is when you're paying your taxes every, you know, when you look at your paycheck and you see a deduction, that's just sort of an estimate. And so when they talk about making estimated quarterly payments, that's generally for 
in this specific case, that's generally for businesses that don't have a, a withholding because they're self-employed or something like that. Um, if you happen to be somebody who owes the IRS money every year, they may ask you to start making estimated payments because of, of your situation. They don't like to be, what when your money is withheld out of your paycheck, it accrues into an account. And if that account, in a perfect world, matches the amount of taxes owed by you, that is what they're looking for. If it's way short, now they're kind of, they're kind of pissy because, you know, you, in essence, in their mind, got a free loan. Now, they're more than happy for you to overpay your taxes, to over withheld, and, and get this big refund at the end of the year. You know, and, and people who don't know taxes, they think they're getting one over on the government and everything else because they got a big refund. Now, you overpaid your taxes throughout the course of the year. You gave them a big free loan. And don't expect the IRS to, to squabble about that because they, they like people who don't understand time value money. They like to be overpaid. And they'll give you that residual amount at the end of the thing. It's, it's not a, a mark that you're doing great by getting a big refund. It's a mark that you've overpaid. Pardon me, overpaid. So keep that in mind. Um... And then tax, yeah, we had all the weirdness with COVID, but taxes are always paid in a, arrears, which means the previous year. So we're in 2023 right now. When you go to pay your, you know, you go to TurboTax or something else to pay your 2023 taxes, no, you're you're going to be paying your 2022 taxes. And that tax year closed out, you know, the end of last year, so you can't make any changes at this point. You're not going to typically file your taxes till April 15th, but things are, for the most part, frozen. There's sometimes some IRA deductions you can change, but for the most part, any changes you were going to make had to be done bef within that previous tax year. So I'll, you know, give you a, a pretty useful strategy to look at what your taxes are going to be um, before the end of the year so that you know if you need to make any changes, uh, you can make changes and have them applicable. So, you know, there may be something about, oh, I'm going to sell my house and I, you know, there's a few days either way or I may be selling some stock or some asset and it's going to generate you know, a taxable capital gain, meaning I've made some money or I'm going to take a loss. Um, it's useful to know that in that tax year so that you can make changes. If you wait till after the 31st, you can do whatever you want with that property or stock or whatever, but it's, it's going to apply to the following year. That'll apply to the 2023 taxes, which won't be done till 2024. So... Uh, Social Security, Medicare taxes. Yep. There's uh, big deals going on. I mean, again, the, the French are a great example um, where th there's massive riots. They're, you know, our news is not, not good. Anyway, they're not talking about any of that. But, yeah, there's huge strikes going on in France right now because they're trying to push the retirement age from, I believe, it's 65 to 67 we're already there, you know, we, we, the Social Security kind of moved that um, date to 67, the, the age where you get the, um, you know, the recommended retirement age. You can actually start drawing at 62, which I will do. Uh, as soon as I turn 62, man, I'm taking whatever money I can because the system is insolvent. Or you can wait till like age 70 something and perhaps get a little bit more. But anyway, um, yeah, the, the retirement age uh, for Social Security and for those benefits and in, in the uh, the recommended retirement age in the United States is is 67. And, uh, you know, a lot of governments are in bad shape. And in fact, in, in Russia, and this was well before the, you know, situation in Ukraine, they had pushed out the retirement age 
beyond the average life expectancy of a Russian. You know, Russians do the health issues and a lot of alcohol and other issues. Um, the average Russian doesn't actually make it to retirement age, so it's it's a great deal for the government because they'll promise to pay a pension that, in many cases, they'll never ever pay. Um, other taxes you're paying FICA, so federal insurance, Social Security, Medicare, Medicare. So a couple different programs out there. There's Medicare, which is the one for people that are, um, you know, of of that age, 65, and it, um, you know, supplements their their uh, medical payments. There's also Medicaid. Medicaid is like a welfare type program. That's for younger folks, but it's, um, you know, a different system. Probably not not as elaborate, but it covers children and other things. Um, yep. Employer matches amount. These dates are old, but anyway. Um, and then, if you're self-employed, you need to actually withhold and pay these amounts as well. So there's all these forms out there: 1040A, 1040EZ, and filing deadlines April 15th, like we said. Um, if you're max performing, you know, getting the the most benefit out of the tax system, you can because again, you want to, you know, we're kind of like rats chasing government cheese. They're they're trying to manipulate behavior, and sometimes it's good. You know, there, there's if you adopt a child, a lot of those legal fees and other fees are paid, um, or essentially paid, you, you get a tax credit for them, meaning you it's taken off your taxes because they want to encourage that kind of behavior. Um, home ownership, there's all sorts of perks, you know, for having a home mortgage that that interest is tax deductible. The, uh, um, you know, uh, different different aspects of, of home ownership are, are incentivized because home ownership makes society a bit more stable and there's you know electric vehicle credits and other things that they're trying to get people to do and that's where those things exist well those are available if you're filing a, a 1040 and you're itemizing your deductions the government also says that hey rather than you know list all these separate expenses we'll give you a standard deduction and let's say that standard deduction is, I don't know, maybe $20,000. And it's like, unless you have a whole bunch of little deductions that end up at 20000 why don't you just take our standard deduction and we'll call it good and save a lot of paperwork and a lot of calculations. But if you're really doing well, um, you know, you have some rental property, you're deducting the, the, the uh, depreciation on that home, um, you're deducting a bunch of other items, your own home, um, you're probably going to exceed that standard deduction, the one the government affords you, and, and you're going to itemize, and you're going to take all your little individual type things. It's kind of complex, but we'll talk more about it as we go. Okay, federal revenue. So this shows, you know, I, it's even blurry on my slide right here, but you know, you can interpolate that income tax is only about 50% of the total tax bite. The other parts are, you know, excise taxes, which are some of those, whatever, different taxes that are played on specialty items, payroll taxes, the Social Security and other stuff, corporate tax, kind of a small bite, but largely passed back on to you, and then other taxes. Um... Highest earning 20%, pay 88%. That is a true, true number. So uh, there's different tax systems you could have. There's a progressive and a regressive. And so you've seen in a lot of ways the, the again, it has to do with donors and other political considerations, but the, the tax code, I would argue, is getting to be more regressive, meaning, let's say... Um, you know, you tax everybody a hundred dollars for something. Um, for the person who makes a million dollars a year, a hundred bucks is nothing. For the person who's, you know, making ten thousand dollars a year, a hundred bucks is a 
substantial amount. So that would be a regressive tax. Now, if it's a percentage of your income, that's probably getting closer to a progressive tax, but it's not quite there. The way our tax system is set up is there's tax brackets, and as you make more money, you're taxed at a higher rate. So not only does the person pay a lot more in absolute dollars, but they also pay at a higher rate. And, you know, that's deemed fair. And I mean, I have no argument with it. It's, you know, the, the wealthier can't afford to, to pay more. And so we'll talk about tax brackets because a lot of people don't understand tax brackets. And there's a, a good video that um, will be part of your thing, and you'll see that, and you'll understand it forever. Uh, here we go. Rise and fall, minimum wage, yeah. Minimum wage, if it was realistic, it would be hugely, you know, the, the, the deal is that wages have not kept up, not at all with inflation, not even close. You know, it, it used to be where, you know, one family, um, you know, you'd have a single bread winner, you know, in the old Aussie and Harriet thing where the, the dad goes off to work. It could be the mother as well. But anyway, the standard thing in the States, in the 50s maybe, you know, in this dream world. And Like even in Spain, when I was over there, I mean, there was always maid quarters in all of the homes. It's like nobody can afford a maid there anymore. But anyway, and then it went to be, oh, okay, well, both, both, you know, parents need to work now. And then they were kind of getting by and people were maybe semi-happy. Now it's both parents are working and they're, you know, still not making it, and they're going into debt. So, it's gotten, it's gotten a bit worse in terms of uh, disposable income and and wealth. But anyway, not to be too negative. Filing status. So the IRS is going to um, charge at different rates. There's going to be different thresholds based upon your filing status. So if you're just an individual, if you're just single. That's going to be the highest rate. You know, a, a a single guy making whatever person making a hundred grand um, is going to be taxed at a higher rate than than a married couple making a hundred grand. I mean, it only makes sense because they're they're making more money. Um, whatever, it's just the way it's done. There's two people being supplied with that hundred grand, having to live off that hundred grand, whereas a single person there's just one. Now, there's also cases where there can be a disparity in income or different tax situations where it may be advantageous to for these married people to, to file individual returns. And that, again, is where something like, a, you know, one of the TurboTax or one of the other automated programs kind of takes over. I'm not shilling for TurboTax. I mean, we're, we're seeing... Um, you know, some of the big companies, all these companies kind of have a, a shelf life. It seems like they are they hit a peak and then their service just starts going, gets worse and worse. And I don't know where TurboTax is on the continuum, but, you know, you look at some of these things like Google or Amazon, their best days are behind them. You know, they're, they're obviously they're trying to buy up the competition now, but they're they're a bit vulnerable because they're, they're, you know, if you've ordered anything on Amazon, it's taking like a month now. Whereas uh, I don't think that's just a anecdotal. I think it represents the fact that they're financially in the same place, not in the same place they were. And you can see all the big tech companies hiring, or not hiring, but uh, laying off all the people this week. So maybe something new will come up. Well, the same may be true of, of TurboTax and the whole Intuit empire. But right now they're kind of the dominant one out there. And I'm not advocating uh, giving these people any money. I, in fact, I don't. I just run my taxes on their program just to uh, double check the uh, individual calculations that either my I do myself or or uh, you know people who work with me do. So it's kind of useful. I'll show you how to do that. Okay, head of household. So let's say you've got um, some dependents, maybe some children. Maybe some older parents, something like that. You've got multiple people in the household, and so it's probably not fair that it's you know 
you're just treated, and, and when I say fair, this is as determined by other folks, but anyway, it's been deemed that, that the head of household with dependents should get the benefits of somebody married, because they've got people dependent upon them. They've got dependents in terms of the tax system, so. And then qualifying widower, widow, whatever, just because, uh, you know, it's a fairly traumatic situation, so for a certain length of time, they'll be able to file in their own status as they adjust. So, 1040, what's going to happen here is all of your income, sorry, is going to go down in a certain section, um, everything coming in, and then that's going to give you this AGI number, adjusted gross income, and then you're going to start to deduct things out, and then it's going to tell you what your actual, you know, that what, what the AGI is, and then you would enter the tax tables with that. This is all pretty time-consuming, and tell you the truth, um, if you're using a computer program, it's actually taking care of for you. You don't actually see these forms, and they ask you the questions with, you know, it's just a little more user-friendly, a little bit more, um, just easier to do. Anyway, so if, if you did that, it would tell you what your taxes are, exemptions, so again, the, the children or whatever um, that are, can claim you, alternative minimum tax, which was something put in there to try and capture people who aren't paying enough taxes, but it doesn't really do its purpose anymore. Um, child tax credits, some things, now these are things that are going to reduce your taxes, some self-employment stuff, health care, other things. And so uh, you're going to come up with a number, and then it's going to look at how much has been withheld. So how much were paid in, in, in really, in, you know, literally estimated sort of payments. And those two numbers are subtracted from one another, and the, the difference is what you owe. So no big deal. And you may get a refund, or you may owe some money. If you owe them a bunch of money, like I say, Things are going to get uh, not difficult, but they're they don't want it to happen again. They they are not anxious to give you a free loan. Um, again, they will not complain if your refund is excessive. Nobody's going to say, you know, we probably owe you some money on interest. So, um, so gross income. That's the maximum number. All kinds of things coming in. And it can be, you know, gambling winnings. It can be all kinds of stuff. You know, interest income, um, obviously the wages. So it's more than just your wages. It's more than just on the W-2. Dividends, if you're doing, you know, have stocks or whatever that are paying that or accounts that are paying that. Capital gains, that has to do with, well, exactly what it says. When you sell an asset at a higher price. And that same model that I was talking about before, <coughs> pardon me, if it's been longer than a year, um, it's going to be long term. Shorter than a year is short term. And the tax rate is huge. You know, it, it changes drastically. So, um, whatever, if you're in a 28% tax bracket or something like that, your tax rate is going to be at that, that higher rate. If it's if it's a um, um, yeah, I'm sorry. On the long term, it's going to be at at around fifteen percent. The way they've got this worded is kind of different. But anyway, on on uh, short terms, like if you're some day trader, um, yeah, you're going to get hit at your normal tax rate on ordinary income, as if it was wages or something like that. Determine gross income. Yep. Different forms for each one. All these forms, if you're, you know, using a service or using a computer program, there's ways to get at the actual forms, but you generally don't see them. They're, it's a bit more transparent than that. Capital gains and losses. Keep in mind, you know, that for a lot of these things, the IRS is, 
gets a statement as well. When you when you get a form in the mail, uh, the IRS has probably got that same form as well. And uh, so if you don't claim the right numbers, it's it's not going to go well for you. Okay, so determining gross income, adding all those things together, and then the AGI, adjusted gross income, um, other things, payments, interest paid on student loans, if they qualify, and other things. The numbers in here may change based upon the rules. So, again, that's a good thing about running one of these programs, because you may be under the impression that, oh, all that interest on my student loans or other things are going to be tax deductible. A lot of times they're not. Standard deduction, yeah. Oh, there's alimony. Alimony is not that common. Um, what do you call it? Child support is not tax deductible. But they don't do alimony so much anymore because the problem with alimony is it comes to to the recipient as a payment that's taxable whereas child support can be whatever and it goes to the same parent and it's um, tax free so you'll see most of the judges work the child support angle because it ends up with more money to to that person standard deduction so this is what I was talking about where the government picks some arbitrary number and says this is what we're going to allow for a, a single person. It's just going to be some random number. And unless your deductions are more than that, don't bother. Just take the standard deduction and use the easier form. So, yeah, they change it each year to keep track, keep pace with inflation. So, these again, old numbers, but different numbers depending on, on the filing status. But standard deduction now, I believe, is about 18000 21000 even. So itemized deductions, specific expenses. So, I mean, this gets crazy. This is all the collecting of receipts and other things. And, um, you know, if, let's say you're, you know, a, a military guy and you got to get a haircut whatever every month as a condition of your employment or let's say there's books or something you have to buy for your job that are not reimbursed <clears throat> by your employer or you're a, a school teacher and uh, you're buying extra supplies that are not provided you're not being reimbursed for you know all these things could be deductions so um Interest income, that's for real estate. And, uh, yep. State income tax, this is kind of a big blue versus red state thing. A lot of the big blue states, California, New Jersey, New York, whatever, would have huge state income tax. And the person who actually paid for it were all the other states because these people from the blue states would, would pay you know, exorbitant amount of local taxes, and then they would, they would deduct that from their federal taxes, which meant that the federal government got less money and therefore would raise the tax rates in general. So there was some switching back and forth under Trump. They uh, put a cap on that, and then obviously under Biden that, that went away. So you'll see that change, but they, they refer to those in general as SALT state and local taxes. So if you were living in California, for example, you would probably be itemizing just because your state taxes would be pretty damn high and um, put you above that itemized, that uh, standardized deduction amount. So real estate taxes, deductible, medical expenses. I mean, it's good news, bad news. The, the good news is that they're tax deductible. The, the bad news is that you're pretty sick. You know, if you're making $100,000 and you have 
that would mean you'd have to have over ten thousand dollars in unreimbursed you know if insurance paid you for it that's not your expense so these are out-of-pocket expenses not not reimbursed over ten thousand dollars so you're pretty ill um, charitable gifts though that's all good and again you know these are things that you know are considered good they have clamped down on that a bit though you know some people were you know selling used cars is a hassle so they donate their car and inflate the value and the IRS is not going for that anymore they have changed the rules because people were you know donating garbage cars and claiming a big reward or a big big uh, um, you know gift credit and uh, the IRS now wants to follow it through to see what that vehicle actually was sold for on the donation and if you wonder why all those donate your car type things kind of went away it's because yeah they the you know crappy cars were not going for that much money and so it didn't make as much sense other expenses yep I've done this before where you know let's say you have a car with just collision on it or you don't have collision meaning if you get in a car wreck you're responsible for the damage to your own car um, yeah you're you're not going to get any money from insurance, but you can write it off as a as a loss. And then the job expenses, which I kind of referred to before, things that are unique. And uh, again, it gets very complex in the rules. You got to read them, you got to figure it out. But there's ways to get around that. Not ways to get around. I'm just saying there's ways to get around the difficulty of the IRS publications. There's uh, other methods to get an understanding and then just verify it with a code so what you're trying to figure out is whether to itemize or use the standard deduction so I haven't taken the standard deduction in 20 30 years uh, if you own real estate you're you're gonna be the standard deduction is is not gonna be enough I mean I think I think the MOA loan, I've got a house in Eagle River and, and then a place out here, and I think my, my Eagle River home, I, I think it's ten or 12000 in in uh, uh, property tax, so it's easy to exceed that deduction. Yep, just showing the form again. So TurboTax, we'll look at that uh, in a bit. Exemptions, so these are for the people that, um, you know, are living with you. Now, again, you know, there's a lot of divorce, a lot of divorces with children. Only one parent can claim. Now, if you have two children, you know, one parent can claim one child or however the courts. I mean, obviously the courts, they do some horrendous things, but... Yeah, so they'll end up with some awkward family situations, but um, anyway, for any particular child, only one parent can, can claim them as a dependent. Taxable income is that more refined number. It's gone down from the gross income, and AGI was used and then they took out the deductions and exemptions and then you theoretically would go into the little chart and it would tell you you owe this much tax again for most people the program tells you how much tax is to be paid this is so this was 2021 but this gets into this notion of tax brackets I'll run through it really quick there'll be again another explanation video but You'll hear people, you can really tell a lot or, you know, how little people know about taxes and the way they refer to tax brackets. People will say things like, well, I don't want to make any more money because that's going to push me into a different tax bracket. If that person says that, just, just you know, whatever, be polite, but realize that person doesn't have a clue and they should not be doing your taxes or giving you any advice because they don't they don't understand the situation. Now it is true that if your income gets to a certain threshold, you might not be eligible for certain programs like, you know, 
the Affordable Care Act, the Obamacare stuff or other things. You'll see people say they don't want to work in a certain profession or want to cut back on their hours so that they still qualify for one of those government programs. That might be valid. It's not a good thing, but, you know, it's the government incentivizing, um, you know, people being less productive, but, but it is what it is. But anyway, so this is how tax brackets work. So let's say somebody's doing pretty well, um, by pretty well, you know, not super well. Let's say they're making right at a hundred grand. Okay, so what's going to happen to that person's income? And I'll go down to the single individual just because it's easy. Okay, so person makes a hundred grand. The first little tranche of income from dollar zero up to nine hundred and you know, 9,000, basically 10 grand, nearly 10 grand, they're paying 10% tax on that income, okay? That amount of money that they make from 9,951 up to 40 grand, 40 and a half, is taxed at 12%. That person next income is taxed from, you know, from the, the income from 4526, up to 86 is taxed at 22 percent and then for their final bracket their income from 86 376 up to in this case a hundred thousand because they're only making a hundred grand is taxed at 24 percent so let's say some person you know using you know kind of the idiots example let's say somebody says well, I'm making 86375 and I don't want to get paid any more money because if I do, it's going to push me into this other bracket. What they fundamentally don't understand is let's say you're making $86,376. All of your income is going to be taxed at these respective rates for those different tranches. But that one dollar that exceeded, you know, three hundred and seventy five, eighty six, three seventy five is gonna be taxed at twenty four percent. Not the rest of the income, just that dollar that exceeded that amount. So, you know, your first chunk of income's taxed at this rate. Up to forty grand's taxed at twelve percent. That next bit of income from forty five two six up to eighty six is taxed at twenty they're brackets. There's not some sort of retroactive thing where, oh, your whole hundred grand is taxed at 24%. No, the only part that's taxed at 24% is everything above 376, 86, 376, up to this higher limit that you didn't achieve. So that's what brackets are. So it's, and this is where this sort of progressive tax. Well, this is where the progressive tax comes through. The more money you make, you know, the more money, you know, the absolute number is going to be quite a bit higher just because the numbers are higher, but the rate is also higher. So that's how it, how it works. Now, keep in mind, these are federal taxes. So, you know, the states can do their own thing. In fact, some of the states like New York and stuff have, They've upped the rates on people making, you know, a millionaire tax or whatever. Well, guess what happens? They don't have any more millionaires. <laughs> the great thing about being a millionaire is you can move, you can hire a lawyer, you can do whatever you need to do. You ain't going to pay that tax. You will you'll you can skip away from it. You go to the Caymans, um, you'll re-characterize stuff. It's, 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 uh, whatever, it, it. It doesn't work. There's there's a guy who's he's not controversial, but some people think he is. It's, it's, his name is Art Laffer, and he's a Reagan era kind of guy. And his big concept, uh, he's still around. You'll see him on the news now and again. But he had a thing called the Laffer curve, and what that meant was there's a sweet spot where let's say maybe it's 24 percent or something like that. If you tax people at that rate, the government is going to get the maximum amount of money. If they tax 37%, the government's take is actually going to go down. If you tax at 10%, accordingly, the government's 
income is also going to go down because the percentage is less. So there's a sweet spot in here where, because what happens if you tax at a higher rate, people are like, they, they work harder trying not to pay their taxes. Or maybe they they just go, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to make over, you know, 500000 because they're going to charge me, you know, they want some whatever tax of 80% for every dime made over five. 23600 guess what i'm not going to work that hard because this this threshold is is too high and this you know again these numbers reflect um these are were the trump numbers so they're not necessarily as excessive if they were redone now they might be higher numbers but anyway what what happens is if you think about it in terms of like a pizza right if if the economy is small um you know, you're you're looking at a small pizza, and so let's say you you take a, a twenty percent slice of that small pizza. It's not a lot of pizza. Now, let's say instead of taking twenty percent, let's say you take fifteen percent, but because the tax rates are better, you know, there's a lot of things that influence investment, and the tax rates are are you know whatever judged to be more fortuitous and and people invest more and the economy grows and the economy's thriving you end up with you know perhaps a large pizza and so although the government's only taking you know 10 or 15 percent the slices are much bigger because the economy's thriving and so you know that that's it's it's a a concept that's not really understood very well and and that you know a lot of the politicians who who are in favor of so-called millionaires taxes and stuff they probably understand the math but they realize their constituents don't so it's a good you know popular issue and and they'll never fall through with it they'll you know they'll do what the donors say to do but they'll come out and campaign saying that they're going to tax the rich and if you look at the rich they're nope not happening all righty, long-term capital gains. So, um, what can happen here? Yeah, so these are just the different rates um, long-term. So, um, less taxes. If it was um, a short-term capital gain, it would be paid at whatever that amount was. So, let's say back on this example, you know, you made eighty six three seventy six and then you've got a thousand dollars you know from some stock sale well now that stock sale is going to be added in here and charged at the twenty four percent it's going to be charged as if it was just wages whereas if you kept it over a year you're looking at long term and it would have been taxed at one of these lower rates I mean twenty percent but damn you made five hundred thousand. Four hundred forty-five thousand, whatever. You can you can deal with that. Determine your tax liability. So we talked about how to do that. Go into the chart, figure out what it is. Tax credits. So credits and deductions. Deductions are good. Credits are amazing. So a credit means that let's say you go into the chart and you would have owed, you know, let's say. 20 grand in federal income tax. If you've got a thousand dollar credit, well, that's going to come. It's a one to one thing. It's going to come off a uh, thousand bucks. So you would owe nineteen thousand if you had that thousand dollar credit. So credits are, you know, used for uh, you know fairly special things. They're they're um, they're much more valuable to you. Now, if somebody says, "Oh, buy this." ticket or give to this raffle or, or do whatever because it's tax deductible because it's a, a qualifying charity. What that means is it doesn't mean a one-to-one. -one. It means your income comes down by that much. So again, rolling back to the same chart, let's say you're making, you know, 86375 and you have a $1,000, you, you give you know, money to somebody, and it's a thousand um, dollar, you know, tax deduction. 
It just means that your income would be taxed at 86375 right? Or 85375 $1,000 less. But the actual money in your pocket um, means that you saved just 22% of that. So, 220 bucks. I'll go through this a little bit more later. Let's, uh, you know, well, I'll, I'll show you the TurboTax. It'll make more sense. But, um, in essence, tax deduction just means that that percentage is coming off. You're still going to have to pay the other amount. So, the short answer is tax credits are way better. But, they're not for everything. Yeah, try doing that if your income exceeds a certain level, which is not very high. I thought I was going to be getting a break on that and found out I didn't qualify. Coverdale savings accounts, um, 529 savings accounts, IRAs, um, 401ks, things like that. Um, we'll talk about that, but I'll say one thing right now. For example, let's say you're doing your term paper and you want to get an A on it. And so you talk about, you know, your plan for life and, and you plan at some point in the future, you know, having children in your relationship, whatever that is. Um, and so there's children and you're going to save for their college because, you know, it's a good thing to do. So you put some money in some regular mutual fund and, and you know, the kid ends up with $100,000 in that account for their college savings and, you know, you turn it in and you get a B on your paper because you screwed up. There are specific accounts that you could have used, and one of them is a 529, where you could have said, I'm going to save money for my child's college education, and I'm going to put it in a special 529 account and designate it as such from the, from the get-go, from the start. And so when that child gets to be that age, that child can pull that money out of that account and it's not subject to any taxes because it was used for education and you designate it as such. The other person in the original paper who just got to be, say they gave their, their you know, they had $100,000 in, in their account and they're going to, you know, cash that out and give that money to their, to their student. Well, they're going to get taxed on it because it's just normal income. And so, you know, your kid's going to get, I don't know, maybe 85000 something like that, 15% capital gains tax. So, you know, y you could have done the right thing and studied up on it a little bit and realized that, again, in the tax code, there are certain things they want you to do, and saving for college is one of them. And so they have uh, programs out there that will uh, encourage that. Earned income tax credit, um, not doesn't apply for most of us. And um, um, anyway, I think most of you are going to be beyond that limit here pretty quick. Um, like I said, child care, adoptions, all that stuff, taking care of your kids, adopting other kids, it's, that's all viewed as a good thing. Another turbo tax type thing. We'll go there in a second. And then homework. So, problems five and nine. Okay, so the TurboTax program probably timed out on me, but we'll see. They're kind of annoying. Um, so, I created an account for whatever, just for general purposes. Um, and it's, it's all fictitious information. So... Um, you can do this as well. It's not a big deal. If I can get this thing to send me the code. I might have to pause the video while I get this thing working. All right. So back at it. So TurboTax, you know, because they have all your financial information, it's obviously going to have at least, you know, two-party identification or two-factor. Two anyway... Um, but you can see, you know, my name is not just J, but, you know, the silly computer doesn't know. You could, you could program whatever number's in here, so that's not actually my last name. No, that's not correct either. But it will work for 
the purposes that we're trying to do. So anyway, the good news about all this information is if you put it in year to year and you're, you know, one of their customers, all this stuff is sort of pre-populated, which makes things a bit more efficient because, you know, you spend your time actually doing your taxes rather than entering all your, you know, employer's information. For this example, I'm just going to use single. Um, yeah, I'm going to say no kids. I just put in a bogus address, right? Zip code so it knows I'm in Alaska. Make money. So typical, no extra money. And single. Yeah, I don't care. I am just want to show some examples of what can be done here. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put in... Uh, and they're going to try and upsell you. Now, the, the reason why I use TurboTax for this example is none of these programs charge you until you actually file. So you can go run through these, do all your examples and everything like that, and not um, worry about you know having to uh, pay any expenses. I'm going to say, well, I'm going to put some numbers in here, but obviously not mine and invalid social security maybe they've got more elaborate since last year because <laughs> I use this all the time I'll put in a few fake numbers Five, four. yep there we go just didn't want all the same numbers now it can also these things can import data so it's all intermingled and uh, nope, I'm just going to type it in myself. And so bogus numbers, again, bogus employer ID, the whole thing. They're not, you know, that smart. I'm just trying to run this for an example. Um, yeah, whatever. It can have an address. Okay, so the wages. To keep things simple, I'm going to put in 100000 bucks, right? Social Security wages, typically different, but I'll just put in the same 100000 keep it simple. I'm going to say they kept out twenty grand. i am not doing such a good job of doing the withholding, Social Security. Yeah, I don't know. What was it supposed to be? Nah, I'll go with 6800 That seems about right. Oh, wrong numbers. Eh, just put up in the thousands. What I want to see is I want to see how much it says I owe in tips. Or not tips, but uh, um, taxes. State taxes, all that stuff would be entered in down below. And it would come through and do all your state taxes. But my point is, number one, you're not seeing a whole bunch of forms. Um, it's all pretty transparent. You can go back and do the forms, but if you start with the forms, uh, sometimes it's just... It's going to be frustrating. You're going to be spending a lot of time. And I kind of like this method just for checking things out. Um, it says I paid too much. Amount we calculated. Remember, if you... Good thing about Social Security tax is if you exceed the amount, like let's say you've got... Um, and it doesn't actually catch side hustles. It will here in the... Uh, when you're doing the program... But the government will only typically hold 6200 bucks per year per taxpayer for Social Security. So let's say you're making, you know, you've got a day job. And back when I was teaching full-time, I, I exceeded these amounts. And I had to literally get in there and and uh, I waited till the tax season. And, and I got a bit of a refund because um, neither employer, I didn't make a big deal out of it. And they didn't know that. You know, I had both things going on. So, anyway, they're going to give that money back because I overpaid on Social Security. whole bunch of questions that may or may not apply. I'm not going to go through it in detail too much. Um, continuing on. Um, I'm not going to show any other income right now. Did I sell anything? So you would start entering some of that data off of these forms, these 1099Bs or DIVs or whatever you got. Uh, 
for today's purposes, nope. 1099Ks, nope. 1099s are a big thing. 1099s are for basically gig kind of income, but they'll come for other things. 1099Gs, like, for example, let's say you win a bunch of gambling money, that would be a 1099G. Foreign bank accounts, they're trying to track that down. Keep less than 10000 and you'll stay out of trouble if you're that fortunate. Okay, so now it's kind of happy with the income. And it should say, okay, so paying $20,000, having $20,000 withheld, I had too much money withheld. Now, it's all just notional numbers here, but that's what it's going to work on. I just want a number out here so that I can go through and do some of these deductions so I can explain uh, some of the things. Again, they're trying to upsell. Good on them. I don't need any of your stuff. I mean, maybe you do. Maybe you want to get involved with these people. And it's probably better than going to, you know, I've had some knucklehead friends who have worked for uh, oh, Jackson Hewitt or H&R Block where they hire these people and they come in for a weekend course and they learn everything about taxes and you can't learn enough. Um, if you've got a relationship with, if you've got complex taxes, it may be worth hiring somebody to actually do them, but not, you know. This is kind of an intermediate thing. I would I would hope that these people are maybe full-time tax people, but that might be a stretch. But, you know, I don't know whether, like, Liberty Tax for the guy, you know, spinning the little arrow, goes in and fills out some returns later in the day. It's I That's what I'd want to do. I wouldn't want to stand out there in the cold. Um, foreign bank accounts, I'm saying no. So it gets kind of upset if you don't, ask it. Nope, I don't have any foreign trust. We're going to skip through this and we're going to go to deductions and credits. Okay. Again, I don't need too much help here. Okay, this is, it's auto-populating from uh, last year's example, right? So it knows I have a home, so I'm probably going to be deducting mortgage interest and it knows I'm going to give some money and in this case, I'm saying it's just goodwill. These are all self-entered items. Interest paid, GG. Obviously, there's not a bank called GG. Goodwill actually is out there. I didn't make any estimated time of payments. Medical expenses. Again, medical expenses, as you know, they would have to exceed 10% of your income. So, unreimbursed ones. Kind of sad. Health savings accounts. We're not going there. Home or credit. Nope, I didn't do that. And, you know, it's it's going through, and if you look this at the forms and some of the programs out there, these would be on there as well. But this is just a little bit more efficient, maybe. If you're going to do something with your taxes and you're confused on it, there are tax guides that are put out. Um, and they're pretty useful. They're written kind of in layman's terms. And then they'll reference back to the original IRS publication. And then you look at the IRS publication that may or may not be overwhelming. But if the IRS publication is kind of too much, too confusing, uh, there's plenty of companies out there that have tax guides um, that do that. Money on school expenses. So it's looking for deductions. And no, I didn't do that. Um, I should have done this stuff, but in this example, no, I did not. Individual retirement account, or Roth account. Um, Foreign taxes, nope, not doing that. Taxes on a motorcycle. So it's going to go through and catch a lot of these things. And so it's just a good reminder. So what's happened here is uh, this is the amount of tax money. It's green number. That's the amount of money I'm getting back. Okay, so let's look at a real world kind of example. Let's say I'm somebody who's maybe renting a condo and I'm thinking about buying a house. And in addition to the rent versus mortgage amount decision, I'm trying to figure out what's, you know, what's a better thing to do. Now, there's a lot of things lifestyle-wise that, you know, may change between a condo and a house. But from a financial perspective, if I buy a home, the mortgage interest, so part of that payment, because the when you pay, say, you know, $2,000, on a on a home mortgage, 
a big chunk of that, especially on the new purchase, is going to be interest, and the interest is tax deductible. We'll go through all this in a in a later thing, but but anyway, just take my advice on the or my just take it as as fact basically that that on the first few years of a say a thirty year mortgage, eighty to ninety percent of your payment is interest, and then towards the very end of the loan. A very small amount is interest, and most of it's principal. The payment never changes. If it's a 30-year fixed, the payment is exactly the same, but the ratio between uh, interest and principal being paid is vastly different. And, you know, it's not great to pay a ton of interest, but it is all tax deductible. Your payment's not going to be, not going to change, but um, that's why it's kind of, as, as a house, as it's nearly paid off, it doesn't have the same tax benefit. Okay, and then also for real estate taxes, those are tax deductible. So if the numbers are exactly equal, um, because of the tax benefits, you're probably better off um, taking a, uh, uh, buying the home. And also the quality of life. I mean, uh, there's a lot of other aspects that go into it. Okay, so let's say... Uh, the, the interest paid, you'll get a form if you're a homeowner, if you got a mortgage, you'll get a 1098, right? And that 1098 will tell you how much interest you paid. So I'm going to look at my 1098 that I got from this mythical GG bank, and I'm going to enter in a number. And um, where is it? Yeah, it's got all these things. It'll auto-populate and loan it in there, but no, I don't want any of that. Uh, and I'm just going to, well, it, it definitely wants to auto-populate, and I'm not going to let it go. Yep. Fair enough. Type it in myself. And does somebody else loan? The seller financing didn't receive a 1098. Anyway, special cases. Mortgage interest. Let's say I paid $18,000. In mortgage interest so let's say I'm paying about two thousand a month and that's twenty four thousand dollars worth of house payments and in this case I'm saying eighteen thousand of that was interest which is you know not crazy and let's also say I live in the MOA you know municipality of Anchorage so I'm paying nine thousand dollars in property tax and let's go ahead and take credit for that. Whoops. Outstanding mortgage principal. Uh, I just this isn't going to change things, but I'll say it's 285 grand. Not huge. See what just happened on that number? I just got that deduction which was translated into um, uh, increase on my refund. Now it was a tax deduction. It was not a tax credit. That's why it was whatever it calculated my tax rate at, probably around 24%, it took 24% of that $8,000, $18,000 and that $9,000. And, and anyway, I got more money back. So you'll have to look at your actual example. But that is the benefit of, of home ownership from a financial perspective that those numbers were were deductible. Okay, so now we'll go through another example. Um, I'm kind of done with this. I just want to get into regular deductions. And it's not going to let me, is it? It's going to want to ask a bunch more questions just to refine things, and it's all good. Uh, do you, if you only have select yes. Details about the loan. HELOC is a homeowner equity. Oh, it says it right there. Okay, congratulations. I got that tax break. It's already reflected in there, so I know that. Okay, one other thing I'm going to look at is charity. Okay, so it's already pre-populated because I said I you know, gave to the Goodwill last year. I'm going to give to Goodwill this year. And... Let's see what tax bracket I'm in. So, 
I am going to, so right now, keep look at this number, 8317, and I'm pretty good, whatever. Um, I'm going to give a, a thousand bucks worth of furniture or something like that. Again, um, you know, I'm not expecting to get audited, but you should maybe have some pictures, maybe a receipt from the thrift store, maybe something. If you're saying it's genuinely a thousand bucks, um, and they have things to estimate for you, you know, or companies that will keep track of it for you, but Nope, I'm going to, John Wayne in here, I'm data deduction, so 10, 22, uh, 2022, the operable thing is that it needs to be in the applicable tax year, which 2022, so if I put, you know, 2021 or 2023, that tax year is not being addressed, these are the 2022 taxes, so that's the reason they're asking for that, what was it? I'm saying it was household items. Sure. Description, you know, maybe something to jog your memory when you get audited and you're drugged before the uh, the people. Furniture, I actually spelt it right. I'm going to claim it's a thousand bucks. Method used, I'm going to say that's, uh, you know, comparative sales, something like that. Consignment store, There's a lot of different options. Thrift store value, because it is kind of a thrift store. Okay. Done with the deduction. See what just happened. So I went from 8317. So I got what was that? A little over 200 bucks back. So why did I not get a whole thousand dollar? Because it's not a tax credit. It was only tax deductible. And so the only portion I got from that was whatever that my tax rate was probably, you know, something in the 20%, which would equate to to that. So I, I, I think that makes it a little clearer. But you could you can go through and, again, as I've shown you, you can put in BS numbers. Now, again, this is sort of like your, your term project where, you know, you can, these websites, you can enter in kind of bogus information. Uh, they don't really care. And nothing has been filed. This is... Nothing gets done with the IRS until I hit file, and then that's only after I pay them the money. So, uh, you know, I could go back and, and change all these numbers back and forth, and, and I could go back to my info and go, you know, I'm going to get married next year. I wonder what that's going to change. And so I'm going to, you know, whatever, change different things. I'm going to change my filing status. I'm going to claim single, I want to run it that way, or I'm going to, you know, I've got a new job, and I'm going to be making more money, I, I wonder how that's going to affect my taxes, or in my case, you know, I think I've got a tax deduction because I'm paying, you know, horrendous tuition to an out-of-state university, and then I find out late in the game that, oh, by the way, that's not tax deductible because you exceeded the income level. I would have known that had I had I run TurboTax, you know, as a, as a trial run. So, anyway, there's other companies out there besides TurboTax, but, you know, these guys are kind of like the Google. They've got their fingers and everything, you know, Credit Karma, Mint, everything we've talked about. They kind of own a chunk of it, um, which is good and bad. Um, they're super easy in terms of importing documents. They can even import, you know, W-2s. It, it just you can maybe sit down and actually make some progress and then spend your time doing taxes by trying to figure out how to minimize your taxes in future years. You know, there's two different things out there. There's tax evasion and tax avoidance. Evasion is criminal. You'll go to jail. That's not good. Avoidance, that's how the game's played. You, the, the tax code is set up for you to pay, you know, to encourage you to pay the least amount possible because that means that you're, you know, doing good things, you know, home ownership, adopting kids, doing all that kinds of stuff. Now, the tax penalties for, you know, not paying your taxes or skipping out on your taxes, they're, they're horrific because, well, it's just the way that they enforce the laws. It makes sense. You know, if you're, if you're the FBI and you're trying to catch some guy with drug money, it, do you really want to get out there in some shootout with stacks of drugs and weapons and everything else? It's, 
you know, people get shot doing that. What the IRS has done and what the politicians have done is they've upped the penalties on all the tax codes. So now all you have to do is you go to that, you know, drug dealer and he's got a stack of a million bucks and you ask where the tax return is. Where did you get this money from? Where was this income from? Show me the tax return. You can't produce the tax return. You still go to the prison, but you know nobody got involved and nobody got shot here. So that's why the uh, the in most people's minds the the penalties on on uh, tax evasion are you know so steep is because a lot of times they can't bust somebody doing something else you know some criminal act but they can't bust them with with tons of money that they can't account for and you know giddy up you're still in prison that's what that's what they want and so they'll they'll get to that end by um, by using the tax code anyway um, but again don't overpay your taxes follow the follow the rules and make sure your your refund or your amount owed as as little as possible Good luck.